Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome, and thank you for joining us. My name is Michelle Jakes, and I'm the Chief Curator at the Art Gallery of Greater Victoria. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's talk. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that we are gathered here on the traditional territory of the Lekwungen speaking people. This project, The Breathing Wall, Connie Michelle Mori and Taryn Walker, is part of a series that the Art Gallery does called Offsite Insight. In that series, we move around the CRD and even beyond that, around Vancouver Island. And in that movement, we think about the different territories that the Art Gallery does its work on. In this instance, this project has brought us to what is really the heart of the territory because we're just a few meters away from the inner harbor where the Songhees village would have stood before the communities now known as Songhees and Esquimalt were moved forcibly from that important location as part of the colonial project. So we come together here thinking about the site, the history of this land, which is made even more complicated by the fact that we're sitting in a space that was part of the Esquimalt and Nanaimo Railway Corridor, which of course is also part of the colonial capitalist project. But the railway also speaks to histories of industry and employment and moving people up and down the island in order to bring them together. So it's within this context of a very complicated narrative that Connie and Taryn chose to do this work. I'm not going to go into too much detail about the exhibition itself. I'll let the artists do that. Um, but I do want to talk about um, how I feel about the opportunity of participating in this project. I was brought into the project after Connie and Taryn had already started talking about working together so the Art Gallery of Greater Victoria came in as a sort of collaborator, as did Bayview Place, who um, now own this site and who very generously allowed us to do this project here. What I would like to say is, is how important it was to me to have the opportunity to participate in this project with Connie and Taryn, particularly at this time. The Breathing Wall is about um, metaphorically speaking, the idea that walls don't separate us, but that walls are permeable and that they can connect us across time and across geography and across cultures. When the artists started the project last year, we had no idea that by the time the exhibition was mounted, we would be in the middle of a global pandemic that steals people's ability to breathe or that we would be months into global protests about racial equity prompted by the murder of George Floyd, whose last words were, I can't breathe. So writing about this work was very um, emotive for me. It was a real honor to have the opportunity to think through what we're going through in the world in the context of these artists' remarkable works. Um, I will uh, briefly introduce Connie and Taryn um, uh, before we hear from them. And before I do that, I just want to thank them both for inviting me into this project as a collaborator. It was a really wonderful project to engage in with you. So uh, first, Connie. Connie Michelle Mori lives and works on southern Vancouver Island on the traditional territories of the Esquimalt, Songhees, Malahat, and Cowichan peoples. Her studio practice explores the experience of home as ecological interdependence through site-specific performance and participatory sculptures documented by photography and video. Her work questions the relationships between ecology, displacement, and belonging. Connie's practice is influenced by childhood experiences, living off the land in a rural area, 
while being surrounded by family traditions of masonry, construction, and textiles. Her family history commingles settler and indigenous identities, and her studies in sculpture, ecology, philosophy, post-colonial studies, and art education have impacted her interest in displacement and the politics of marginalization. She holds a BFA in Visual Arts from the University of Lethbridge, as well as an MED in Art Education and a studio-based PhD from the University of Victoria. She teaches at the University of Victoria and Camosun College and has exhibited and performed in Canada, Europe, and Southeast Asia. And uh, Taryn Walker. Taryn is a queer Indigenous artist of Salish ancestry whose work explores concepts of identity, tenderness, cycles of life and death, and the supernatural through drawing, printmaking, installation, and video. In 2018, Taryn graduated from the University of Victoria with a major in visual arts and a minor in art history and visual studies. Most recently, in February 2019, Taryn received an individual artist grant from the First Peoples Cultural Council. This funding assisted in the creation of the work in her first solo exhibition, Sentiments of a Swarm, at Archive Artist Run Center, by providing financial support to secure studio space and materials, and to learn printmaking and bookbinding techniques. In 2018, Taryn was awarded the Diane Mary Hallam Achievement Award by the University of Victoria for academic excellence and commitment to the arts. And in 2017, she was long listed for the Philip B. Lind Emerging Artist Prize presented by Presentation House Gallery for demonstrating excellence as an emerging video artist and photographer. Her work has been presented in many spaces and events such as Luna Arts Festival in 2018, Integrate Arts Festival 2018, Basque Coast Music and Arts Festival, 10th Anniversary 2018, the Ministry of Casual Living Window Gallery 2018, the UVic BFA Exhibition 2018, and the UVic Odain Gallery 2017 and 2018. So they are obviously very busy artists and uh, it's so great to have them here with us this afternoon and uh, to hear more from them about this exhibition. Thank you and please join me in welcoming Connie and Taryn. Um, thank you, Michelle. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, it's really great to see some new and some familiar faces. Um, before we begin talking about our process and um, then afterwards welcoming questions from you, we wanted to express um, gratitude to people who we've had the pleasure of collaborating with through the process. Um, in particular, or I think first and foremost, um, Michelle Jakes, um, who, as she mentioned, curated uh, the project and who has been an absolute gift for both Taryn and I to work with. Um, we also wanted to thank the very supportive team at AGGB. We felt really surrounded and supported um, by them through the process. Um, the Roundhouse for generously donating the space. Um, Lara Minja of Lime Design, who did really thoughtful work on the publication. I'm not sure if people have had an opportunity to look at it, but um, she did really stellar work in putting that together. And we also wanted to thank Sarah Cowan for her input, inspiration, and support with the project. Um, I wanted to personally thank David Holloway, who's standing back there, um, who's responsible for sourcing and assembling all the trifold window um, frames and who's been a wonderful support to me throughout the project. Um, in the video, he um, is in the background and cannot be seen, but took literally probably 3,000 photos for that. Um, I also wanted to thank his son, Jordan, who helped to get things here, and my children, um, Indra and Solly, who are always inspiring supports for me. Wonderful. Thank you, Connie. Um, I also have a few individuals I would like to extend my gratitude towards. 
Um, I'd like to thank uh, Mackenzie Albright and Clint Wilson um, from the Art Gallery of Alberta for their um, support and guidance and wisdom uh, with um, helping me create uh, the video installation uh, components and setup that you see in the space today. I'd also th like to thank um, MK Bowen for volunteering their time and ex expertise um, in providing installation support. Um, they helped me hang a lot of the drawings that you're seeing today and did a stellar job. Um, and last but absolutely not least, I would um, from the bottom of my heart like to thank um, my parents for their unyielding support, specifically um, my father for facilitating access to both um, written and oral histories um, from our Indigenous ancestry that really fueled a lot of the inspiration for the research for this project. So I am deeply grateful for all of those individuals. Um, Taryn and I began working on the breathing wall in April of 2019, so about 18 months ago. And um, throughout the time, the core concept of the project remained the same, but the work really changed through research, um, through the process of making, through collaboration, and through political events. Um, originally, we wanted to work on a project that envisioned a wall as a healing membrane, a wall of connectivity between past and present, humans and nature, individuals and groups that are often perceived as separate or divided. Um, we were interested in a wall that showed our connection to the natural environment in that um, we're not separate individuals above nature, but we're enmeshed. And the phrase that we had originally centered the project around was, I breathe the land, the land breathes me. Um, while a major part of the focus of the project at that time was environmental and ecological, we were also interested in the social and political ramifications of a wall that breathes. Um, we were interested in how marginalized groups are often kept on the periphery based on divisiveness and how nature can be exploited because it's viewed as outside us and how we can experience indifference with those marginalized by class gender, race, and sexuality because of walls of division. We wanted to make a space for a wall that made our interdependence evident and empathy and action possible. Um, just prior to us conceptualizing the project, there had been a lot of talk about a, building a wall between Mexico and the US border, um, which I'm sure we all remember as a way to divide and keep people out. There was also around the same time a human um, chain or wall that was made outside of the Al Iman Mosque in Victoria that was organized by Sikh youth to show support for the local Muslim community in response to the tragic shooting at two mosques in Christchurch, New Zealand. Um, I've been thinking myself about um, something for a long time um, in relation to the project, which is two quite different views of us as individuals. Um, one of those views is what's referred to as self-contained individualism, the idea that individuals are separate and self-contained, and also what is referred to, I, well, I, that view of self-contained individualism is really prevalent in um, Western and often capitalist cultures. And I was also interested in an ensembled view of the individual in which the individual is always a part of an ensembled community. And um, I think the ensembled view of the world is expressed in a lot of Donna Haraway's um, writing, even though she might not use um, that term specifically. Um, even the individual for her is a community in itself. She says that something like 92% of the genomes of an individual are made up of fungi, protists, and bacteria, um, some of which are just hitching a ride on us and some which make it possible for us to survive. So for her to be one is always to become with many. 
So while the project had its nucleus that begins with our relationship to nature and the land in that I breathe the land and the land breathes me, the project was of particular interest because a breathing wall speaks to this idea and much more. Wonderful. Um, I like to start by saying that for me, art is really a product of its time. Um, a physical manifestation of the re reactions and emotions us as humans have to the environment um, we are creating in. Um, that And reactions that can't necessarily be put into words, um, but can be created as part of a visual language. Connie and I could not possibly have foreseen how prevalent the concept of breath would be today, um, eight, especially 18 months after the idea of the project began. I've been getting asked the question a lot um, of how has it been making art during a pandemic? Um, and the answer is complicated, but the, I, the shortest answer is very challenging, emotional, um, and at times difficult to keep moving forward. But I believe now is an important time more than ever to persist in the creation of art making. With the pandemic, civil rights movements globally and indigenous land defense across Canada happening simultaneously, there was no way we could ignore these events and their relationship to the project. Because of the collective pain, sadness, and trauma felt by these world events, the way we dealt with discomfort changed greatly. As Connie mentioned, we were originally looking from a very um, ecological and social perspective, but all of a sudden, um, things, I guess, became evident, evident of honing honing in and I guess honing to the heart. Our direction moved from being a more overt confrontation to a more soft and tender engagement with that discomfort felt by these um, very, um, at times upsetting, yet historically important events happening worldwide. Resulting, um, in the works taking on a tenderness and a softness that although we had not originally envisioned when we started originally discussing the concept, um, it felt very important and integral to the project. The introduction of the Roundhouse as a venue also made us consider um, the relationship of the project to collective Canadian histories, of walls, movement of people, and breath um, in a new light. Um, I know for myself personally, I had originally been envisioning uh, the work outside, so to bring it in to such a beautiful and historical space um, created an important change in the work. Um, as, and as well as just pract in a practical sense, how logistically we would be working with this site and to use it to its best potential. Um, and dealing with this building's expansiveness and almost sense of breath, um, which included um, introduction of video and other uh, components that just seemed to feel right and fit perfectly when introduced. Um, now I'll turn it over to Connie. Okay, I was just going to briefly make mention of what the project components and the exhibition components are so that um, when we talk about them with a little bit more detail you'll have a sense of all the work. Um, so the project together as a bigger umbrella project includes this exhibition with works that were created specifically for the project, two video works, a website, and a publication that um, intentionally focuses on our process. So the publication is over um, at the table if anybody's interested in looking into that further. The exhibition itself includes 
um, a drawing series by Taryn that are placed in the trifold window frames that I believe includes 50 drawings. Um, and her video animation that is titled Today, I Feel Like an Island, um, which is on the screen of the back wall. And also we serendip serendipitously discovered that it projects on the wall behind it as well, which I think we were both really delighted um, with. Uh, Release is a series of, series of sculptural masks that I created that really changed a lot through the project, um, through the collaboration with Taryn and also responding to her work. Um, the Space Between You and Me is the title of the works of crocheted moss or lichen that are placed in the window frames. And the video projection that's behind us is titled Failing, Falling, Learning to Breathe. And although Taryn and I made a lot of the works individually, the way that they evolved and changed through our process was really highly collaborative. Yes, um, collaboration really felt like an integral uh, part of this project. Um, and even, I guess, a part of uh, the art making and the artwork, even though you can't physically you, you have the you have the results of that that collaboration here today, but um, it kind of resides in the space and spirit. Um, and even though Connie and I, um, Connie is located in Shawnigan Lake, and I am now living in Edmonton, Alberta. We were separated by provinces during the process of creating this work. Um, this collaborative. Um, I guess nature of the project um, was super important to all of our decisions in the process, direction of research, discussion, and ultimately the final product. Um, our discussions about process, um, emotional responses to world events like the pandemic, as well as discoveries along the way all helped to inform the individual process of making. Um, along the way, we were able to exchange notes on the research we were exploring, uh, photographs, and like many collaborative efforts uh, currently in 2020 through meetings over Zoom. Um, we were luckily, lucky enough to have an impeccably timed in-person meeting in March um, this year to do a site visit at the Roundhouse um, to fur further discuss the projects and the vision. Just, I believe, two or three days after I returned home to Edmonton, everything shut down. So it really felt um, serendipitous that we were able to make that happen. Um, during these few days, we exchanged material tests um, and provided each other with feedback, which was incredibly pivotal for the project's direction. Um, for example, the garden colors you see in Connie's sculptures today were a result of those discussions uh, that we had during that weekend, as well as um, the setting for uh, the video installation that you see in the back there. Um, it was in response to Connie's documentation of herself in forested locations. So throughout the course of this project, I've felt that the collaboration or collaborative process has been incredibly, incredibly symbolic um, from the installation components to the color palette to the publication. There has been a continuous flow of information, inspiration and common purpose. This exchange resulted in a mutual agreement for the need of tenderness in the work. Um, for uh, both, of, both of us, healing became a common theme and greatly informed the works that you see here today. Um, so on that note, Connie's going to delve into that a little bit more. Yeah, so we wanted to spend just a little bit of time um, talking about the role of healing and tenderness in both the work and our process. Um, as Taryn mentioned, it's been a recurrent theme throughout the project. 
Um, I'll speak a little bit to how it's manifested in my work and then Taryn's going to speak to how it's present in her drawings and the video. Um, tenderness for me is a gentle attentiveness, but also a sensitivity to pain. Um, I think the sensitivity can be the result of thoughtfully attending to a wound, such as a tender bruise, whether um, physical or um, emotional. And tenderness, I also think of as an action of empathetic attentiveness towards the self and another. Um, I, I personally think that healing occur, uh, happens when we enact this form of attentiveness, when we are vulnerable like a wall that breathes, rather than closed like a wall of division. Um, through the process of researching and making work for the exhibition, I became really interested in moss and the role, its role in healing. You'll see moss in the video and um, in the window frames. And originally the masks had moss coming out of their mouths. Um, so moss is incredibly tender and a resilient species that I have been so inspired by. Um, I read Robin Wall Kimmer's book, um, Gathering Moss, and discovered that moss are pioneer species in ecological succession. And ecological succession is not only the change and development of an ecosystem over time, but after a disturbance. And I think that's what really interested me in it is the idea that it, it is one of the um, only species that heals after something's been wounded or disturbed. Um, it's often the first species to grow in ecologically depleted industry sites, such as bare rocks and tailings. It can grow on almost nothing where other plants can't, and um, it develops thin soil, and as the moss develops, the soil thickens, allowing a space for other species to grow. So its process of healing involves holding space for other things to have growth. Um, while working on the breathing wall, I became really fascinated by the role of mosses in initiating the healing processes of the earth. And while I was working on the breathing wall, I was also involved in a studio project that took me to several abandoned mines, um, clear cut sites and industry sites where I found that moss was the common denominator growing in places where the land had been wounded or depleted. Um, in clear cut areas where industry's solution to depleting complex ecosystem is to plant a single species of tree, moss begins the process of healing where nothing else can grow, um, making a foundation for other species. Through this process, I became really aware of how human attempts of, at ecological succession are often futile and often insincere, yet moss activates a more intelligent system of healing than that put in place by humans. Um, while I was making the video that is behind us, fall, um, failing, falling, learning to breathe, I was really thinking about two things. One was the futility of our, um, our acts and attempts to heal, where we do the thing where we plant a single species over and over and over again to replace complex ecosystems. And I was also thinking about the importance of acknowledging these failed attempts. Um, I don't think that any healing or progress is made unless we are able to um, accept that we are implicit in systemic harm whether, for example, through environmental abuse, complacency or neglect, through white privilege, or through ignoring that history forms our present, we are our history. Um, the video is a manifestation of my thoughts around the, whole, um, the role of holding space for falling and failing as a part of the process of healing. Um, a friend of mine a couple weeks ago sent me a quote by Ang uh, Maya Angelou, that says, do the best you can and until you know better, then when you know better, do better. And part of this, I think, requires being able to be present with the ways that we fall short. Um, the crocheted um, lichen or moss that you see in the window frames um, is titled The Space Between You and Me. And I, while I was working on them, I was thinking about how small crocheted moss walls make our um, connections or, or dependencies evident. I, I find it um, 
interesting that a lot of the walls that have been um, suggested or built as divisive walls are often big, heavy concrete walls that appear to be permanent. And I, I got some delight in making really tiny walls that you can see through. It just, it felt like a really small, attentive, um, tender process. Um, the sculptures that are in the middle of the space relief um, for me bo involve both healing and loss. Um, they're made out of wood, uh, reclaimed wood, uh, repurposed wool blankets, and I think blankets comfort us and protect us and keep us warm. Um, as Taryn mentioned, the colors evolved in collaboration um, with her and they are garden-like colors. The works actually changed a lot by me seeing Taryn's um, drawings when we met in March um, at the um, at the Roundhouse to um, talk about the exhibition. Um, in addition to being made out of um, reclaimed wood and uh, repurposed wool blankets, they are made of components um, from surplus World War II gas masks that I ordered on Etsy through the Czech Republic. So they were delivered. It's amazing what you can <laughs> get from anywhere. Um, what I was interested in in those, including those components, is that they make the work look discomforting. And I wanted there to be a sense of loss or sadness evident in them because I really think that we need to be present with that loss in order to be able to move forward and to heal. Um, so collaborating with Taryn has also involved a lot of tenderness, not only in the works, but I believe in the way that we have been able to hold space for each other. And um, so I'd like to give pause so that she can share with you about her beautiful works. Thank you, Connie. So, um, firstly, I would just like to share, um, I guess, something recent that has happened to me that brought, I think, a whole new depth of meaning for this work for me. Um, a few days ago, um, I, my, my father came for the opening, and um, we started to have a very somber discussion about our indigenous ancestry, the current times in history. Uh, during that discussion, he reminded me that wherever we go, we carry the histories of our ancestors with us. And in my case, the only reason that I am able to sit here and share this work with you today is because I am uh, an answer, I, I'm a descendant of an ancestor that survived the smallpox pandemic that decimated BC. Um, so <laughs> I, I think subconsciously I was almost uh, thinking about this of how um, people that have came before me have almost lived through this reality and these types of fears uh, once before. So uh, when approaching the creation of the works for this, uh, the breathing wall, I was still, um, or I am and still and continuously doing a lot of reading um, from Indigenous scholarship, specifically uh, Canadian Indigenous scholarship. And early on, I was introduced to the concept of healing through memory and healing through storytelling. Uh, and this greatly informed my drawings and kind of the, I guess, the subject matter I began dealing with. Um, I wanted to offer images of, of healing and tenderness, um, of community and, um, uh, uh, and nature, thriving and growing and flourishing and rejuvenation and rebirth. Um, I, around this time, I was also introduced to the concept of individ, uh, indigenous futurism, which is a, a emerging art movement um, with the idea that indigenous peoples have already lived through uh, an apocalypse. And uh, this, these artworks are to imagine a post-apocalyptic and decolonial future. Um, so 
coming from that perspective, that's where when I started to really delve into this work. So uh, the beeswax that you see the drawings encased in, um, the process for that was I first drew on a very strong um, but incredibly thin uh, Japanese paper that was then uh, dipped into a vat of beeswax and layered and layered over and over again. Um, I feel like the beeswax is almost this extension of these ideas. Not only does it look similar to something that is bodily, like skin, um, but it is also a symbol of both life and preservation, um, with the hopes that because these drawings are waterproof, they will be able to withstand weathering and um, be able to live uh, in the future. With uh, the underlying sadness um, of some of the works, uh, I wanted to all, there to also be sweetness. Um, I love including floral elements or elements that are unexpected and um, almost joyful. Um, for me, I, my, my own personal process of healing myself and my ancestral trauma is incredibly important to sit with um, and to sit with this pain and sadness and acknowledge it. Uh, there's an importance in healing parts of yourself in order to move forward, but I also believe uh, in order to participate in the collective uh, healing of community. Um, my video that you see at the back is really um, a symbol of this process uh, for me of sitting um, with these uh, feelings of pain and and healing, um, but all, and being present with that and being present in order uh, to uh, move forward and be present with the land and the land's healing process, as kind of Connie uh, mentioned a bit in regards to her work. Um, so on that note, I think Connie has a little bit more to say. <laughs> I, we actually haven't heard each of our portions of the talk, so I'm just so engaged with what, um, with what Terrence's saying. So um, we actually, we wanted, we're close to ending, and we wanted to, before we um, hopefully engage in conversation with you guys, um, and we wanted to end by bringing uh, Michelle's voice in as an important part of the process. I'd like to read two short quotes from her insightful introdu introductory essay at the beginning of the, um, the publication. Um, so the quotes are from the actually the first paragraph of that, and I've just taken a middle um, portion out of it, but it's so thoughtfully articulated. Um, and I think along the whole um, process, uh, Michelle's brought a presence to it that is um, that that has meant a lot, I think, to both Taryn and I. And um, so the quote is: "We live at a moment when walls and breath are encumbered words. Walls have become barricades aimed at keeping people divided. Breathing, an instinctual behavior essential to our survival, has become something we struggle to protect." whether from viruses or police violence. Contemporary events have pushed these terms away from their more common definitions. The breathing wall aims to reclaim the positivity of these concepts as not a device of partition, but rather an animate, penetrable structure capable of breath sentience, and to use a word that the artists both regularly utter in relation to their project, tenderness in its ability to demonstrate both vulnerability and care. And I think I speak for both of us um, when I say that Michelle's trust in our process and her articulation of the project in the essay has um, demonstrated a gentle respect and sensitivity that really helped to form the tenor of the work. Perfect. So on that note, um, we're going to open the floor to questions and 
a little bit of discussion. So if you have any burning questions, we'd be more than happy to answer and uh, give our most thoughtful responses. I, I can say as a teaser to questions that the project originally <laughs> was supposed to, uh, or we had intended for it to be at Beacon Hill Park, which we haven't talked about much, um, but we ended up um, in the Roundhouse instead. So the original project involved um, performance, a community performance, and other installation elements that would be a much more temporary situation um, in Beacon Hill Park. And we, we've ended up um, here instead. Anyone? Just, just speak up, please, if you have any any thoughts, experiences, questions. Do you want to speak? Um, so I had a show at Archive in November of 2019, um, and I believe I applied for it in 2018. But through that process, I believe, Connie, were you still working at Archive yeah, at that time? At that time, I think when Taryn's application came in, I was the program manager at, at Archive. And I think seeing Taryn's show and meeting her, I, I actually, I just mentioned this to her, I think on Saturday morning or Friday morning, <laughs> um, that I think I just felt there was an authenticity and an integrity to her in her work that really made me want to work with her. And I also saw some overlap in terms of our interests in um, perhaps ecology and interest in connection to the land and a sense of this interdepend interdependence that um, I thought would potentially um, be, be a good collaboration. Yeah, for sure. And I think I would also kind of felt similarly about Connie's work. Um, I was very flattered to be approached by an artist with much more experience than me. Um, but also when the uh, ideas that Connie proposed, I felt like I could really bring um, some something to them as well. Wow, that's a big question. It's like asking somebody how they became who they are. <laughs> um, I know that as a child, I feel really fortunate that I lived in a very rural place and my parents did not put, um, like many people that probably grew up in a similar generation, my parents did not put very many constraints on me. So I was probably from the time I was five years old, I would wander the forest by myself, even though they were the same forests that, you know, my uncle had shot a bear in, or there we knew that there were other animals in, but they just somehow let me do that. And I think that those are the moments I remember as my creative moments as a child. It's like um, looking at different things in the forest or climbing up chair rock and sitting in it. So having all these quiet, attentive moments. Um, by myself as a child, um, I think are what probably initially formed this idea of being wanting to be present or being, I guess, privileged enough to experience the opportunity to do that. I was also somewhat shy and quiet until I was probably eight, right? So I spent a fair amount of time by, my, by myself in the early early years and had two sisters who who took up some space. So, so I spent a bit of time by myself in the woods. I think that's, and then I've had great mentors, right? Like the um, person who was my supervisor for both my master's and my um, PhD was an, is an incredibly trusting human being who doesn't get in your way, just lets you do what you need to do. So. Um, being exposed to people like that makes a difference, I think, as well.
Um, I wouldn't say in, in, the, in the repetitive sense that memory came into my work necessarily, but um, my, my work has always really dealt with um, personal narratives and the idea that when we place two images or um, a thing juxtaposed to another thing, it's going to uh, trigger a memory or a personal narrative or some sort of story within us. So um, with drawing, I love using really, I guess, like almost like iconographic looking figures or um, almost like heavy contrast symbolic looking animals and that sort of thing um, with the idea that when the viewer sees like an animal juxtaposed next to this figure that they're going to um, start creating that story or that mem or tapping into that memory that they hold um, within themselves. So. I, I think I not only work with my personal experience with memory, but also, I, I guess, giving space for the memories of others. I think I am really interested um, just personally in science fiction. Um, so I think of it less as like a supernatural in, in terms of, I guess, like a fantasy legend where there's like a dragon or something and more of an exploration of what things could look like. So maybe um, playing with uh, like a bird, like the way a bird looks, but uh, changing it somehow to make it almost just off or unsettling or dreamlike. Um, and kind of like um, I mentioned in my answer for the question before, um, delving into that sense of imagination. Um, that I feel like we, we all, all possess inside of us. And exploring, I guess, the world as we live in it with a sense of wonder and what could be. Do you, want, do you want me to speak? Sure. Here? <laughs> um, um, I guess Taryn and I were in the space in March, earlier of March of this year. And so if I think if we hadn't have been in this space, it would have been harder for us to envision how it would have unfolded. Um, there, was, there was things that changed subtly by being um, here the second time to install. Uh, but I would say, um, like the placement of the of the mass changed, or the floor is highly uneven. So um, the masks have a, a vertical line on them, and if you place that on an uneven floor, it becomes really apparent. So there were things that we couldn't have predicted that ended up informing how we installed the work. But also, I always think when there's a limitation like that, it's almost like a gift. You know, it ends up helping you to problem solve in a way that you wouldn't have otherwise to become up, almost come up with a better solution. Um, so there were things that happened um, like that or that Taryn ended up with um, 
you know, four to six strings on some of the work instead of two, because we didn't predict that when the doors are open, that the wind flows through here and some of them start doing this. Um, so there were those things. And then the string, I think she actually appreciated. It started yeah. to become part of the work in a different way. So in that way, there were changes that happened, but not so much in terms of the, a lot of that was really mapped out in um in march when we were in the space together yeah i i agree with connie i think just because this building is a historical building and there were so many i guess like unique you logistical problem solving that went into it we really had to um put thought into beforehand where what where everything was going and how i guess things were um, interacting in, in the space. I mentioned it briefly before, but um, one of my main tasks was logistically um, figuring out how we we're going to do video in the space. Um, and we have all these beautiful big windows, but they're, they interfere with projector light in a big way. So um, luckily I had resources in Edmonton to help me with that. And then the art, art gallery, um, uh, of Greater Victoria here also um, was pretty integral to that problem solving, which we just wouldn't have been, it wouldn't have been possible for us to, um, I guess, work out those kinks on the spot if we had not thought about that beforehand. Yeah. Yeah, I think one of the main things that really changed for me in, in my work in approaching this, um, a lot of the drawings I had been doing prior to this exhibition, um, at least I feel they had this a much darker undertone. Um, we're dealing with things like destruction in more of an overt way and more leaning towards I guess like the decay um, end of the spectrum. Um, but I think while we were making this work, I, I guess I was asking myself, what, what do I personally need in this situation? And I really felt like I needed tenderness and community and hope and I think what, since I kind of was making a lot of the drawings or like in April and May when things were really getting intense, um, I think it would have just been too depressing, honestly, to uh, make, make darker work or less hopeful work. Um, I think almost kind of ironically, that sense of lightness and hope is, is a breath in these times when things feel so heavy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would, I would agree with what Taryn shared. I think both of our works, we talked about this before together, that both of our works change from, if you think of a spectrum of sort of, I think, was it your aunt that used the words um, sweetness oh, and sadness and sweetness. sadness and sweetness or if you thought about beauty and loss these two ends of things that sometimes artists I don't think we're unique in negotiating that but sometimes artists negotiate the space between those two things because you want to represent the world as complex as not just pretty um, and not just tragic but you want to hold space for the complexity of the world and I think in the beginning are, if there's a scale of that, it, it leans more towards a little bit of a darker or like my masks originally had hoses of moss coming out that didn't have any space in them. 
like they couldn't breathe. There wasn't like this idea of growth. And, and um, when I came in and looked at Taryn's drawings and as time went on, it was like, they need to be open. There needs to be this sense of breath. So I think both of our works, because of what we felt was the importance of including healing and tenderness um, at a time when it feels like there's not a lot of space for that. Like I'm sure that many people here felt the same sense of um, sadness or being overwhelmed by what's been going on in the world. And so the works I think really did change in response to that um, by trying to create some sense of tenderness for ourselves through the making and, and to be viewed by others, yeah. Um, we had originally, the website was actually part of the original project plan um, with the intention, I think, um, as Connie mentioned before, we had um, planned to have the exhibition outside. It was going to be much more temporary. So I think the idea behind the website was to provide somewhere where people could experience the work um, after after it was done, if we were just um, setting things up for a day or if the, the, the nature of the work was just more fleeting. But, um, it, and it, I guess it's evolved a little bit as the project has um, changed, but I feel like it feels like one of the few original ideas that really stayed the same. Mm -hmm. I think the website too, we're gonna continue to evolve that. Like we wanna have the videos as a component of it and all of the work um, on the website is process-based work right now. So um, as we document this, that, that will change it um, as well. Um, we have talked about um, the project being in other places or spaces, um, so that is something that we're interested in doing. Um, so we briefly talked about that, Barbara, but it's felt pretty full on. <laughs> <laughs> Just getting um, this in the space and, um, you know, working from a distance and, um, yeah, I guess until probably March we weren't really, no, not March, um, what June? June? June. We weren't sure about the dates and how it was gonna um, go, and so I, I feel so thankful that it's that it's here. So once we have a little bit of time to rest, <laughs> we'll we'll talk more about that. But we would like it in other spaces, I think. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I think also through the process of this project, um, both Connie and I have had ideas for. I guess, I guess future individual artistic projects for sure. So I feel like it's felt prolific in that sense mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I became obsessed with the word eco-futility through the project. <laughs> and so that's definitely going to evolve into something else. I think. Yeah, and I, I feel like I definitely want to continue with the wax. This was my first go at doing uh, the wax and drawing process, and I'm very excited to keep working with that and experimenting a little bit more. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. I. So. When we were originally talking, or when Connie originally approached me, actually, with the idea that the project would be outside, um, the wax came out of me problem solving how exactly I was going to present drawings in an outdoor setting without them very quickly getting destroyed. Uh, for example, if 
it rained or it was really windy and, and that sort of thing. Um, but also, um, I, I, I do love the idea of preservation for sure. Um, drawing is notoriously hard to work with in a studio setting, especially when you share space with other people because if your paper gets dusty or moved and crinkled accidentally, it can potentially ruin your whole artwork. So um, this felt really, I guess, um, fun and playful and natural and um, if things, I guess, didn't turn out exactly how I wanted them to, uh, it was fine. Or if stuff fell off my desk accidentally and there got a little crinkle in it, it just felt like part of the aging process, not so much like, oh no, this has been ruined. So um, I really enjoyed, yeah, I guess thinking of preservation in a practical sense and both a, a metaphorical sense. Yeah. I also like noticed in your work that their work that I've seen previously, there's an interest in space, in drawings entering space. And I think, or I guess I wonder if the wax provides a different possibility for the drawings too. Like if I think about the little flies that stick out from the walls or the banner that you've done before that actually enters the space rather than being a framed drawing on the wall? I don't know. There... Yeah, I think, I guess my overall approach to my drawing practice is I'm really interested in um, installing drawing um, in as many different ways as I can that isn't just pinned to the wall. Um, I'm, yeah, I, I think one thing that really came out of my BFA at UVic was um, how sculpture and painting, um, even uh, like media art, there are all these kind of, I guess, like rock stars of the contemporary art world, but drawing has this quietness and just kind of takes a back seat. So I was really interested in, um, I guess, bringing drawing into more, more of a, I guess, less traditional um, sense and um, a less, less process-based sense, so like a kind of more of a finished uh, work. So I think the wax, I've been just really inspired by it because it really feels more, I guess, intrusive in space and more of kind of this finished, almost sculptural thing for me. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Yeah. We, we had actually originally proposed frames because we thought it was going to be, or, or we had envisioned it being in a particular um, part of um, Beacon Hill Park that's along Haywood. I don't know for people that are familiar, it's a, sort of a wilder space that I used to live um, beside there and was really interested in the complexity of the people that engaged with the um, space. And so we had originally envisioned um, frames that were out of reclaimed wood and that the drawings would hang in those frames. And I, I remember when we met in March or just before that, I had proposed the possibility of doing window frames. I can't remember where that came from, to tell you the truth. Do you? I, I just I don't think so. I can't remember either. All of a sudden there all of a sudden there was window frames. All of a sudden we thought, <laughs> oh when, this would be a great idea. And before we met in March, we'd actually built three of the wind the trifold window frames to bring in and test in the space. So that happened earlier on. Um, but I think, oh, it was in response to this space. The oh. window frames were in response to this being an old building to the windows in it to sort of the structure itself these types of beams and that idea of seeing one thing through another and um yeah they became a solution to adapting what was happening at beacon hill to the thanks for helping me remember barbara <laughs> through, the, <laughs> through the question yeah
Anybody else where it looks like that? We have a few minutes left. If anybody else has any more questions, we'd be happy to answer them. I'm glad that people have had questions. It's always nice, I think, as somebody who teaches, it's, it's nice when you're not the only one that's talking, <laughs> I think. It's, uh, it feels much more like a, a whole process. Um, so I, I really appreciate everybody um, sharing thoughts and, and being here. All right, so feel free to stay and um, wander around. And look, Taryn and I and Michelle are, are here. If you guys have any questions, we'd be happy to um, talk one on one with a mask on <laughs> um, as well. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for coming.